آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ What do you think about our first principle? Well, I think it does reflect uh, a good normative uh, ideal to uh, work towards. I think when the internet just started, uh, there were many principles, many of them technical ones. There was the so-called end-to-end principle that was supposed to reflect how you know, packets would travel through the networks, which didn't really aspire uh, to any broader democratic, liberal democratic principles. So I think it's important for us to have some indication for where we want to go, and I think this principle is a good first step. Uh, but having said that, I think we also have to have many footnotes added to that principle. We still have to understand uh, what and who makes the data internet, right? Essentially, it's fine to be working uh, towards limiting the power, the private powers to the public powers, but the brutal reality is that most of the services are still provided by private companies, Most of the uh, infrastructure is provided either by private companies or the governments, and uh, there's nothing we can do. I mean, NGOs, as powerful as they are, are not going to build the next Facebook. They're not going to build the next Google. So uh, given those constraints, and I've seen many NGOs try and fail, uh, there is it's just they need to be a different working method. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we have to be pragmatic about it. Chances are, most of the services will be provided by private players, somewhere in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. So the big question and the big footnote that I think needs to be added to this principle is that understanding that the involvement of private companies is inevitable, and understanding that the presence of public actors, governments, players like that, is also inevitable. How do we make sure that they behave in a responsible manner? And here we have to consider ways in which we can actually exert pressure governments or companies through civil society ventures, through projects like yours, mm-hmm. we have to understand how are, uh, you know, what are the ways in which you can make Facebook respect the fact that now it's a prominent public space, the new public square, people talk about the issues. How do we make Facebook accept that responsibility? And so far they have been quite resistant to do it. Do you see the internet as a sort of democratizing power then? Well, that also is uh, a good starting point. Yes, the internet definitely has a liberating effect, mm-hmm. which is one of the many effects it has. Yes. So as a platform where people can exchange in communication, where they can exchange ideas, where they can learn about the world and opinions of other people, of course, it is liberating to that extent. But that's not the only effect. Right? Mm-hmm. You can also think of many cases in which it has boosted, as I've said, the powers of governments to spy on their citizens, or to spread propaganda, or to engage in cyber attacks, and, you know, cyber harassment, intimidation, I mean, the list is very long. So while it's important for us to work towards maximizing the liberating potential of the internet, and, you know, maybe a better understanding of it as well, uh, it's also important that we not lose sight mm-hmm. of those other ways in which it can be used by more nefarious players to advance an agenda that is far from democratic. So part of my project in the last few years has been trying to bring more awareness about this darker side so that when we shape the policy towards the internet, but also when we shape global policy towards things like democracy promotion, that we're actually well aware of the fact that it's not just maximizing the liberating potential. It's not just about building websites. It's not just about training bloggers. It's not just about facilitating exchange of ideas. It's also about much more complex, challenging, complicated, unpleasant, and dangerous activities like building anti-censorship tools, building anti-surveillance tools, forcing companies to behave more responsibly. And those tasks so far in the West, at least, have received far less attention. And that happened precisely because it's much easier for policymakers ministers of foreign affairs, or staffers, to go on singing praise to blogs and social networks uh, and thus show themselves to be modern and uh, you know, up, up sort of on, on, on latest technologies, as opposed to going and trying to regulate the companies and making the very uncomfortable and unpleasant message, delivering that message to their colleagues in law enforcement and telling them, if we really want to preserve the internet, as a liberating space. We need to curtail our own surveillance uh, activities uh, on social networks or just you know, looking at the traffic. Uh, all of that needs to happen. And that hasn't happened so far. And um, my 
my fear is that this fascination with the liberatory potential uh, will be used just as an excuse not to talk about more uncomfortable subjects. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how can the average sort of netizen um, bring about change? You see, I'm, I'm very suspicious of the very term netizen mm -hmm. because uh, no one who uses the term seriously has so far shown me how the concept of netizenship relates to the broader concept of citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. So unless someone makes that connection explicit and makes it intellectually substantial from a broader political philosophy, political theory perspective, I refuse to use that term, mm -hmm. except when I really turn on my populist mode and uh, where I have to engage in discourse, <laughs> people already use the term netizen. So maybe I'll do it this time too. Um, so what can an average netizen do? I mean, pressure their governments, you know, make sure, because you see my, to, to track back a little bit, my ultimate theory is that <laughs> look at the United States. So the United States in the last few years has emerged as the most, you know, loud and aggressive and maybe even well-intentioned supporter of internet freedom, promoting what I call the internet freedom agenda. On the assumption that the biggest threat to internet freedom comes from China, Iran, Russia, Middle East, you name it. While if you really analyze the developments on the internet in the last few years, you would see that that's American intelligence community, you know, FBI, CIA, NSA, American companies uh, working together who are posing the biggest threat to internet freedom. Whether by building censorship tools that are then exported to dictators, whether by building surveillance tools which end up in dictators' hands as well, whether by not having um, a well-developed stance on issues like anonymity, there's a whole bunch of issues. They're all Western issues. They all need to be regulated domestically. So if you really buy into that premise that what emerges is that the biggest threat to internet freedom is in America and in the West, not in Iran or China. And if that really is the case, I mean, on the one hand, it's very depressing because, uh, hey, uh, the enemy is at home. But on the other hand, uh, it's also uplifting because if you really believe that democracies still function as they should, which again is a bit of a uh, there are ways in which citizens can influence those agendas. You know, there are political parties more and more, and I'm very glad to see, for example, the Pirate Party emerge as a viable player, for example, in Germany, in Sweden, and elsewhere in Europe, uh, who are politicizing these issues to a point where they can actually change government policy. They can recognize that, yes, there are many good things about the internet, yes, there are many bad things about the internet, and we have to make sure that our government uh, acts responsibly, keeping in mind both its domestic agenda and its foreign agenda. Um, so I think what citizens can do is try to see this space as political and try to see who are the key players, who are the key actors and entities and institutions that they can uh, influence in order then to push governments to behave more responsibly. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as I like talking about civil society and NGOs and activists, I still believe that most important things on the internet freedom agenda, if you will, are still ultimately to be determined by governments. Mm -hmm. And it's those governments that need to be pushed around. And this is where citizens, of course, can uh, exert the greatest change. I mean, there are many other smaller things citizens can do. You know, if you really don't want cyber attacks to proliferate, uh, then you really have to make sure that your computer is not hosting malware. Right? The reason why we have so many cyber attacks is because so many are enrolled in so-called botnets, which are then being used to wage cyber attacks on the websites of Vietnamese dissidents. And as long as each of us uh, doesn't really investigate what's going on inside our laptop when we're not using it, uh, the odds are that, yes, our computer is launching those cyber attacks as well. So there is, I think, an element of internet and computer literacy that needs to be built in, where citizens themselves need to be aware of what their responsibilities are. Do you think there should be any restrictions on the internet? Um, well, as long as we have laws uh, in the real space, I see no reason why those laws shouldn't extend to, extend to cyberspace. Uh, we still have defamation laws, and we can, of course, have a long argument about you know, British libel laws and, and whatnot. I mean, not all laws are perfect, but as long as there are laws uh, on 
that could be potentially very dangerous. I see no reason why we should surrender those laws when we talk about the internet. So this idea of the internet as a lawless space that needs to remain lawless, uh, I, I think it's bizarre. So who should decide <laughs> what those restrictions are? Should that be down to every single individual state or should there be a sort of international agency that kind of decides what? International agency. Well, in the perfect world, yes, of course, there should be an international agency, but we don't live in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I, 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 don't, I can't give you a more sophisticated answer than that. I'm afraid I can glory in about the importance of international agencies, but we all know that very often they fail to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely don't want countries uh, unilaterally deciding on things like censorship, because very often they would use the pretense of stopping the spread of false information as a means of tracking down political speech. So, you know, in China or Korea, that's the way we see governments who in name only claim to be eliminating rumors from online forums and blogs, but in fact what they're doing is eliminating speech that uh, disagrees with the government position. Uh, I don't want to give that prerogative to, to, to governments. On the other hand, I don't want those governments to meet together and produce an international agreement on how to deal with rumors on the internet, which is now being discussed by certain Central Asian countries, China, Iran, and Russia. Um, so all the traditional hurdles and obstacles of democratic and global democratic process and diplomacy, they're all right there when you talk about the internet. They are, in many cases, made even more obvious we don't have the solutions, and I wouldn't profess to have any. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, subject to debate on international law and global justice. And, I mean, all of those debates are still valid and still going on, and I'm not sure there are good ways to resolve them. Um, but here again, I'm just not sure that we would be able to achieve some kind of harmonized set of rules as to how to govern the internet, in part because our laws are not harmonized. You know, the, even within the European Union, they still find many parts of this of legislation that are not fully harmonized. And as long as we tolerate that diversity and legal pluralism, uh, there is no way we'll have a harmonized approach, and there is definitely a danger in that. So keeping that in mind, I think the way forward uh, is some kind of a balance between cooperation and then you know, less election. And I would prefer that cooperation is focuses mostly on um, you know, fostering productive capabilities on the internet. So I don't want an international cooperation on censorship. You know, I want an international co international agreement on e-commerce, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, so this is where I would love more international action. I don't want countries to come together and decide on the common surveillance standards, mm -hmm. because most likely it will not be uh, the standards adopted in Switzerland, it will be a standards adopted in China. <laughs> so from that perspective, I'm not sure I trust international rulemaking in this particular mm -hmm. case. I mean, and what do you think the overall sort of impact the internet has had on freedom of speech? And do you think tools like Twitter and Facebook have actually helped promote freedom of speech? Mm -hmm. It depends on how you contextualize freedom of speech. I mean, if you are eager to have a very broad definition, that also includes things like privacy and surveillance and the sort of broader universe of issues related to freedom of expression, you can easily argue that the overall effect has been negative. Mm -hmm. uh, even though you can self-publish very easily and you have your own printing press and you can do it you know, automatically, in reality, your printing press comes with a little IP address, a little number that then can be tracked. Uh, and uh, yes, you're talking and talking and talking, but then there is a guy sitting somewhere in the local KGB office who reads everything that you publish, learns how to govern more effectively than the rest of you. Um, at this point, there are lots of disagreements. I mean, there are people who think that, for example, people like me overstate the case for surveillance. We claim that uh, it's all easy and you can use data mining, you can hire private actors who will actually track everything you do, track the IP addresses, to, to actually predict dissent even before dissent happens. Uh, many people don't buy that story. They believe in the power of activists to challenge and they focus on two or three heroic cases where activists do use all of the encryption tools ever invented by mankind and they think that this proves that the surveillance state loses. I think it doesn't prove that the surveillance state loses because the, as heroic as they are, this is just three individuals. Right? You can tell their story in a lot of detail, 
the reality is that the majority of people voluntarily surrender a lot of their private information uh, while talking and publishing a lot of interesting things, mm-hmm. while at the same time the government actually gets empowered with all that data. So I would be very cautious uh, and hesitant even uh, not to draw any absolute conclusions about the net effect of the internet on freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just impossible to tell, <laughs> frankly. And anyone who tells you who they know the, the impact are probably charlatans. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you really, it, it depends on the country by country case uh, analysis. Uh, in many cases, you know, you take a country like Russia, where there is no censorship on the internet formally. So technically, few sites, except for really radical extremist sites, are banned. So if your indication of freedom of speech in Russia is uh, availability of websites for internet filtering, Russia looks like a great case. You know, it looks as democratic as any Western European country, probably even more democratic than Britain on the cyber law. The problem is that once you start looking at the case more closely, you see that the government has found better ways to control the internet. They own the, uh, through the oligarchs close to the Kremlin, they own the publishing companies and the new media publishing companies that actually host all those blogs and social networks. Some mysterious cyber attacks on the websites of activists and independent media appear out of nowhere, coordinated by young people close to the Kremlin. Uh, You have an army of commentators who go and leave comments on the websites of prominent opposition to spoil the discussion and take it in the direction that's favorable to the Kremlin. Censorship and control takes other forms than internet filtering. So the reason I'm saying that is that you need a particular lens and a particular framework for grasping what the internet does for each country. So in Russia, internet control will take one form. In Azerbaijan, it will take another form. And my problem with most of the internet scholarship in the last decade is that the criteria they chose to measure internet freedom or freedom of expression on the internet is internet filters. How many websites are filtered? How many websites are not filtered? And when you adopt that as your you know, measure and as your benchmark, it's very easy to see progress where there is no progress. <laughs> Uh, so from that, and you know, reasonably, that's the only metric you can have mm-hmm. to have a quick study. <laughs> and you know, governments need quick studies. That's why you see a lot of governments funding a lot of interesting work, which measures internet filtering and underground Western governments. Um, does it actually say anything about internet control? I'm not so sure. 